Excellent. So hello, everyone, and welcome, and many thanks for joining us for the National TRC webinar series. My name is Danielle Lauder, and I am the program director for the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center, uh, located in Augusta, Maine, but we cover a, a fairly large region, all of New England, all of New York, and part of New Jersey. And we are very fortunate to have a great team of co-presenters here today, and the NETRC is very privileged to uh, be the host of, of this January webinar series, Telepsychiatry Essentials. Um, go ahead and advance that slide. So for those of you who are not as familiar with the Telehealth Resource Centers, there are 12 regional centers situated all across the United States, as you can see um, with this map. And we have colleagues within two national telehealth resource centers, one focused on telehealth policy out of Sacramento, California, and one focused on telehealth technology out of Alaska. And we are tasked through the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy under direction of HRSA's Office for Advancement of Telehealth to provide technical assistance, evidence-based resources for those organizations, individuals who are interested in implementing, planning, evaluating, sustaining telehealth programs in order to increase access to healthcare resources, health resources, distance learning, uh, telemedicine opportunities throughout the United States. So uh, we have a wonderful team of co-presenters here today. So I am going to be extremely brief with my uh, introductions because we have a lot of material to cover and I know that you're gonna learn much from them here today. One logistical thing that I would like to point out with your Zoom webinar function is at the bottom of your screen, everyone is already muted, but you will see uh, on the, in the bottom, on the middle of your screen. Please, if you have content-specific questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A function. You just click on that button and type in your question, and we will save those uh, and, and make sure that they all get answered either directly within the webinar, or if it takes a little bit of further research, we'll be sure to follow up with you after uh, the event today. If you have a technical difficulty or if it's something that's not content specific, please use the chat function that's just to the right. Uh, you can just click on that button and uh, type in your questions. So I think without further ado, we'll go ahead and advance to the next slide and I will introduce our leader, our speakers. The topic of today's webinar is Telepsychiatry Essentials, Getting Started in Models for Patient Education and Special Populations. We are very fortunate to have two leaders uh, within the United States uh, for telemental health that just very, have, have really paved the way in regard to telemental health, behavioral health, and um, building guidance and models specific to this field. Our presenters are Dr. Donald Hilty with USC Keck School of Medicine at Guaya Delta Medical Center, and Dr. Terry Rubinowitz with the University of Vermont College of Medicine and the University of Vermont Medical Center. T Dr. Rubinowitz is going to start us off with a brief introduction. Dr. Hilty is going to talk us through uh, some of the models that he has been uh, served a great role in developing, and then Dr. Rubinowitz is then going to follow up with some local models that, and uh, study that he has been leading for the past several years. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rubinowitz. Thanks, Danielle. You're welcome. So uh, let's get started, as the slide says. Um, I have nothing to disclose. I wanted to acknowledge colleagues uh, throughout the U.S. and locally, uh, Nina Concatelli-Fisk and uh, at University of New Mexico, Felissa Goldstein at the Marcus Autism Center, Carol Rock, also at University of New Mexico, Don Rosenstein at uh, University of North Carolina, our Netric team, uh, Danielle Lauder, uh, Andrew Solomon, and Michael Edwards, and then uh, the local telemedicine team uh, who uh, helps me with everything I do, Judy Amor, Harry Clark, Tara Pacey, and Mike Wehner. Um, just to give you a background, those of you who may not be familiar with what telepsychiatry is, it's the use of telemedicine to deliver psychiatric care education across distances using any available technologies. And there are equivalent terms. The one we generally use is telemental health that covers psychology, psychiatry, social work, et cetera. But anything that has to do with, um, I say anything above the chin is uh, uh, telemental health. 
Um, there's a great fit here with telepsychiatry and what I do, consultation liaison psychiatry, um, because patients may live or be hospitalized in rural or other underserved areas where no psychiatrists with the necessary skills are available. Patients may not be able to travel long distances um, to get to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist may not be willing to travel long distances. It costs time and money to make those trips. And a local psychiatrist may be qualified to treat the patient, but may want advice from another consultant. And so in the work that I do, telepsychiatry really fits. <clears throat> Some patients also who may have avoidant or paranoid personalities or who, who don't want to be in public uh, places may also benefit. That includes kids and adults with autism spectrum disorders, patients who are paranoid, patients who are avoidant. Um, psychotherapeutic and psychoeducational groups are easier to convene when you don't have to bring everybody to one place, when you can meet in space. And it may be particularly adaptable to training and supervision of residents and fellows because it avoids the intimidating or potentially intimidating effect of having several doctors in the patient's room at once. So imagine, if you will, that we could bring experts from around the world all together to consult on an individual patient. There may be an expert in Australia who has particular training in the area or in the uh, condition that we're worried about in a local patient and he or she can be brought in using telepsychiatry um, in real time versus having to make the trip, which might take a day. Uh, the first reports of psychiatric consultations using telemedicine began to appear in the 70s. And I should say that the first paper that dealt with telemedicine was actually in the realm of telepsychiatry. So we kind of hold that uh, uh, very dear to us, that we were actually the first, uh, not me personally, but psychiatry in general was the first to publish in that field. Anyway, the, the reports using telepsychiatry for consultations re, uh, described consultations to primary care providers. As an example, an early report by Salo and uh, colleagues used a psychiatric consultative model that included a referring provider briefly describing his or her patient to the consulting psychiatrist, then an interview of that patient by the consultant and the consulting psychiatrist discussing his or her findings and recommendations. And that model was very well received, very well accepted. Later, not too much later, Dwyer reported the successful use of this modality to provide psychiatric consultations from Massachusetts General Hospital, we call it the hub site or distance site, to a medical station, which is the spoke or the origination site. Dwyer reported that about 30 psychiatrists and 30 psychiatry residents and medical students responded positively to telepsychiatry. Uh, we reported similar findings more than three decades later uh, in 2006. The greatest impediments to acceptance and implement implementation of this modality were the relatively high cost of transmission cumbersome equipment, technical problems, dropped calls, et cetera. Uh, one important additional impediment is called technophobia, that is fear of technology. You will see uh, from Dr. Hilty's presentation and mine later, and maybe from things you've read, that virtually all of these impediments have been overcome. As you can tell, I'm speaking to you now using a laptop computer. It's about one fifth the size of what a, you know, an old television uh, camera might uh, have to be, and 100th the weight. So it's easy, it's cheaper, it's more efficient, and it's more predictable. In the 80s, affordable video conferencing enabled widespread use of this technology, as I just mentioned. Uh, as I said, earlier costs were prohibitive, but if you Fast forward now and look at a study, for instance, by Klidiashvili and Trader, uh, who reported that digital images are appropriate substitutes for glass slides for telecytology applications. I include that because we're now able to show that even applications that require very high resolution can be done using a video conference 
approach. There were high levels of satisfaction reported uh, by patients using telepsychiatry in a report by Ernest uh, and colleagues in 2006, and Doolittle and colleagues reported a steady in decrease in per visit costs, an increased use of an established, of an established tele-oncology service from 1995 to 2005. So <clears throat> telemedicine has caught on. I was gonna say is catching on, it's actually caught on. So it's really taking hold now and people are using this in virtually every area of medicine with good results. Does it work? Well, as I said, satisfaction report by Ernest showed that it did. Another one by Boydell and colleagues reviewed 100 pediatric telepsychiatry consultations, and they showed that neither the technology used nor technological difficulties were barriers to implementation. There are many other studies that show that telepsychiatry works. Uh, we provided psychiatric consultations to rural nursing home residents since 2002, and I will expand on that later. And I would also refer you to an important paper by Basher uh, and uh, colleagues that just came out a few weeks ago. That was a comprehensive review of telemental health applications. It appears in uh, Telemedicine and eHealth. Uh, and I sent a copy to uh, Andrew Solomon for dispersable, dispersal, if that's possible. Uh, if not, just let me know and I can give you the reference. Uh, but it's an excellent comprehensive review of what's being done in telemental health. So I can say, yes, telepsychiatry does work. Uh, with that, I'll turn you over to uh, Dr. Hilty uh, for um, uh, the next portion of this talk. Welcome, Don. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to uh, join all of you today from California, and uh, I'll be talking mostly about uh, models of uh, care as well as education. Let's see here. There we go. Good. So the, I have some references here, and I'll just say a brief word about those. If you want to learn about um, how telepsychiatry or telemental health is effective, the top reference is good in uh, the telemedicine journal and eHealth. Uh, Davar Music and I have written a book on some practical issues called Key Issues in eMental Health, and that's with Springer. And then the, uh, myself, John Fortney, many others have contributed to uh, the discovery of models that uh, telepsychiatry has been used. I did some of this work with my UC Davis colleagues that I'm still in contact with and with others around the country, many in the American Telemedicine Association, the American Psychiatric Association. And the last reference on this slide is a framework for telepsychiatry training about competency uh, based education and evaluation. And I'll say a little bit about that later. Uh, Kathleen Myers has done a lot with uh, children and adolescent telepsychiatry. Uh, Peter Yaldi's started telepsychiatry work in Australia two decades ago, and we worked together at Davis collaborating. He is the person who knows most about asynchronous store and forward telepsychiatry. And then uh, we're working on guidelines that are, are more practical. One of them will be a child guideline with the American Telemedicine Association. So th hopefully those references are useful if you want to read later. So we'll look about uh, how we use telepsychiatry uh, for regular care and integrated care, collaborative care, other step models of care. And we'll look at the, the results of these um, models in terms of clinical issues, technology, and population level impact. And then hopefully you'll have an approach to telepsychiatry education based on competencies if you're inclined. The, while this is focused on telepsychiatry and psychiatry residents, it applies to many of our interdisciplinary partners in telemental health. So looking over time, traditional models of care, people had private practice in person, uh, had worked in the community, might work in county, state, or forensic facilities, some are in academic practices. And the setting variables in psychiatry were outpatient or inpatient care, emergency rooms, and others. 
is also a huge primary care sector where people practice. And in terms of technology, the, the first models were synchronous, meaning that uh, they were live and engaging and interactive two-way audio video. Now we're looking at asynchronous models where you're not joined at the same time, but you can still communicate a great deal of information and do diagnostic assessments. And then uh, Dr. Meyer's work with others at University of Washington combined the models. Excuse me. So in, in my work has done, uh, we've done the most in consultation to primary care. So in the old days, we used to uh, have a patient referred from a primary care clinic. They'd go see a psychiatrist in his or her clinic. And you can still use that model. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't allow the primary care provider or the specialist to really talk that much. And unfortunately, a lot of the patients just simply uh, didn't show to the psychiatrist clinic. Over 50% of patients didn't go to the first visit. Of those who went to the first visit, another 50% uh, did not go to the second visit. So the nice thing about telepsychiatry is if you refer to a telepsychiatrist, patient goes to the same clinic, a primary care clinic, and they see their doc there or they see the consultant at a distance, live video. So that solves the the follow-up adherence problem. Another model is consultation liaison, which uh, Dr. Rabinowitz alluded to earlier. In that model, we do a consultation, we provide advice to the family physician or pediatrician, and they move forward with the treatment plan. Occasionally, they call us again or get an updated consult, but they manage the care. The value of this model is they get input and they get their skills developed better for the future. They can generalize those skills across the whole clinic of patients, not just that single patient. In the collaborative care model, the primary care provider and psychiatrist both provide care. This is better for some patients who have a short-term or long-term high acuity, and it allows the family physician to learn right alongside. Rarely are they in the same room at the same time, although that's easier these days with telepsychiatry. Once again, the telepsychiatrist can be beamed in in a more timely way. And this uh, would be one of your take home points today in addition to the objectives, which is video conferencing leverages your psychiatry consultants uh, time and energy much better because I can see several inpatients today on a hospital unit. I could beam into a primary care clinic for 10 minutes do a quick assessment or give some advice, then I can go to the ER. And in some afternoon clinics, I visited four rural sites in California back to back to back to back. Very, very uh, time efficient. So when we looked at whether telepsychiatry was effective, you know, before 2000, we just relied on basic things that uh, anyone could understand. Uh, were, were patients satisfied? Uh, was it feasible? Uh, and what did some studies show? Uh, and then there, some of us wrote review articles, which uh, were good for two purposes. One, they summarized what we knew, and for those with insomnia, they got some extra sleep. Uh, but the foundation for this is the traditional medicine evaluation and measurement. It, you know, does it does it seem to work for people? Yeah, now we have a different standard. We look at evidence and consensus, and that's what equals a guideline. And this is based on uh, stringent guidelines that are used nationally, internationally. And so the American Telemedicine Association has guidelines. And the foundation for this is the Institute of Medicine, which has gotten much more involved with primary care and specialty care across the country. And they publish guidelines. Uh, and you see the, the link there, guidelines we can trust. There's an evidence base. They make sure there's not untoward bias of some sort. And the quality is very high. So back in the day, we didn't know how telemental health would be received. Would it be good enough? Could it simulate in person with satisfaction? Okay, can we do it? Then we moved on to uh, reliability and validity studies, and we found it was feasible, and we found that when you use uh, at least 384 kilobytes per second, you don't have the motion distortions or the pixelations, and you have quality engagement uh, where people can just sit and talk, which is what mental health care is about, sitting and talking and solving problems. And 
in, the, in terms of the evaluation impact, the guidelines, both by Yellowlees and Turvey, both through the ATA, are good reading documents. Uh, and it's very helpful if you're setting up a program to, to read the basics about clinical, technological, and administrative parameters. And then the models work, I started back in the 90s, and we've published many articles on this to, to be uh, somewhat uh, basic. You know, you have low intensity models uh, where you need less technology and less specialist in, uh, time, and that could be phone, email, uh, or other forms of e-consultation. Mid uh, intensity models involve actually setting up maybe a contract or a regular time to consult with patients in a primary care clinic. And then the high intensity models require a little bit more technology and a model like collaborative care or a randomized controlled trial or doing some therapy interventions that are more structured. The nice thing about telepsychiatry or telemental health is you can use it on whatever system you're practicing in and you can do something that's less intense that will add something to the practice and for the patients, or you can do something much more robust. So telepsychiatry is just your facilitator for that process. So low intensity models, as I said, um, you know, telephone, email, doc to doc, so-called curbside consultations. You can also just use telemedicine to do some oversight of a, a distant uh, provider. Uh, you can use teaching sessions where you review cases with a group of providers and a psychiatrist can comment here or there about some of his or her ideas on how to improve the care for individual patients or the clinic in general. You can do virtual grand rounds, which are much more like a regular grand rounds. And then you can selectively use uh, telepsychiatry to do cultural consultations at a distance, which we did a great deal at Davis. We, in California, we have a diverse uh, population uh, with many different languages, many different cultures, and uh, a large immigrant population. And so if you don't have care available in the way that they would normally seek care and in a language that's consistent with their primary language, you lose some of the quality of the, the discussion, the narrative that's so important with telemental health. And you can beam an interpreter in if you don't happen to speak eight different languages yourself. So uh, you can do a video link with a patient and a doctor and bring in an audio link with an interpreter. Uh, when you can have an interpreter in person, it's great too, but it's not really that necessary. Other low intensity models, um, you, know, you can construct your EHR, electronic health record, uh, to include all the emails between patients and providers providers and telepsychiatry professionals. And that way you have all the, the information captured and you can you go back for references. So if I give a family doc three recommendations on antidepressant use, uh, he can actually cut and paste the, the one he prefers and put it right in his treatment plan. Later on, if that didn't work, he can go back to my email and cut and paste the second option and then uh, he's off and rolling. You can also do warm line consultation programs so that uh, people know you're relatively available and you have a turnaround time of 24 hours. Usually it's a phone appointment between docs. The phone um, is a low um, intensity technology, but it provides the synchrony of people sharing ideas. So the conversations are very short. Family physicians don't want to be on the phone all day with me. In mid-intensity models, as I referred to, uh, there have been very good examples out there. The consultation care model I referred to, which actually has been shown to improve primary care providers' knowledge and skills. There's a nice model with a geriatric nurse practitioner um, being used in mental health to outpatient clinics for diagnosis, for example. You can do disease management from a distance for depression. You can also do program interventions where you help people on the ground do mental health screening, therapy on site, and then you bring in a psychiatrist uh, just as you need them. And then uh, I'll mention a little bit later the asynchronous telepsychiatry program. 
And I've covered some of these, so I'll be brief, but the, the group that's really moved ahead with this has been uh, University of Washington, and the current leader of that group is John Fortney, but the, the leader in collaborative care was the late Wayne Caton, who was a consultant and advisor for me over 20 years ago. He built collaborative care as a model, which is now used internationally, and if he had concerns that telepsychiatry would never work for it, he sure never shared them. He was such a positive person. And so now there's, there's literally uh, people all over the country that graduated from um, mentoring from him and are doing this research. So we, sh we can do collaborative care, which, and the importance of collaborative care is that you use more psychiatrist time, but you can leverage it from a distance by telepsychiatry and you increase, it's not just a high intensity model of care with time, technology, and uh, specialist expertise, it's a high intensity model for impact and it affects patient outcomes better than the lower intensity models. So John Fortney's key point in the recent article was, are we going to use the low intensity and mid intensity models as much as the high intensity ones? Because if the high intensity ones move large groups of people healthier over time, we should do the high intensity models. But I think all of us know we can't do everything as well or as high intensity as we would like. So you have to pick the model that suits your immediate needs, get some experience, and then if you can get some grants or some funding from a contract, then you move up your model intensity and you build your program. Let's see here. So in, in 2015, how do we evaluate? Well, the, the care has to be patient-centered. So telepsychiatry makes patient care more centered because you can connect the patient with the specialist easier and it leverages the time of the specialist better, and that's across medicine. You can now reach special populations with ease. If you, if you have a stepped care model that you work in, let's say you have a case, um, a case coordinator, and you have a, a manager, and you have a medical assistant, and you have a primary care provider, well, what are you missing for mental health services? You're missing a part-time social worker. You're missing a part-time telepsychiatrist. So you beam them in and you fill out the intensity spectrum of your model, but you do it from a distance. Now the key to this is not just people showing up once in a while by video, but building a team approach and having people talk and meet uh, at least occasionally. It's helpful to, to shake hands and, and, and build those connections. So what I'm highlighting here now is that telepsychiatry is, in addition to collaborative care, is an incredible opportunity to integrate care across the country and internationally because we have not been able to reach many primary care settings. And now with video conferencing, we can. So this is the chance to leverage those social workers, therapists, psychiatrists and make side-by-side -side care happen, so to speak, in the clinic at a distance. And telemental health is patient-centered, it is also doctor-centered, at least for me, because I can go to these different clinics all in the same afternoon, and it's system-centered because it helps people provide better models. Now there is a new uh, frontier that we're uh, we're entering into, and I'll mention this briefly, it's not the, the focus of this particular presentation. Uh, the Europeans in other parts of the world often use the word email health instead of telemental health. To some degree, they're interchangeable. Uh, the things that email health would include that telemental health typically doesn't include uh, would be health education on the web or internet for patients, web-based chat groups, text, email, social media groups, some of those linking with the provider, educational modules for patients or caregivers of cancer patients to go and learn about their loved one's illness or their mental, uh, the loved one's mental health condition, 
There are manualized treatments that patients can go through. This is like homework assignments. The young generation uh, not only gets the technology, they like the, the assignments that they can get on the internet. And they, if you put them in testing modules, you can test whether they actually acquire the information. So there's a lot of options out there. Um, there are also psych apps that we can use. Depressed room patients can use Mood Tracker. Or if you're a veteran who had traumatic experiences on the battlefront, you can use VA, the PTSD coach. Um, and there's also asynchronous group therapies and peer support. Now there are several great options that these things offer. They're patient-centered in terms of time. They're low-cost interventions. They're, uh, they provide a niche for some patients who prefer not to come into the clinic. And so those are all great things. There are also some issues. Uh, first is quality control. And someone has to oversee and make sure that the, these offerings are good or you talk with your patient and make sure of, you know what they're doing and then give them feedback on whether that seems like a good program or not. If you use one of these options, it's really important to talk about, okay, we're doing our regular care and what is this going to add? And how are we going to use it? And how are we going to build it into the system? And for my patients, I don't want them to use five or 10 of these at once. I'd rather they just pick one or two and then we talk about it and we see how it helps them. And, and sometimes it helps me because if their mood tracker logs their symptoms, then they can give that to me and I can look at the, the data points as I'm doing medication response curves over time. So, um, and then the last thing is safety and uh, acuity issues. You know, I don't want patients going on a, a chat group when they're feeling suicidal. How would I know? Uh, that's not a substitute. So we have to look at these new e-mental health service options with, with enthusiasm and a little bit of caution. Some of these uh, are just really great um, and are being used, and like Dr. Myers in her uh, collaborative care trial for ADHD built in web education for parents along with uh, teleconsultation. So it was very structured how they work together. That's a, that's a great prototype. Um, but in the future, why can't we consider having photos or videos of patients in terms of how they're doing day to day or sent by a loved one? Um, because if I talk to someone over the phone and I don't have the visual, um, might I get it from a photo, might I get it from a video, or I definitely get it from video conferencing. And a picture really is worth a thousand words. So. The concern about some of this is that we have to make sure of privacy and confidentiality. So anytime we do video conferencing, typically, we don't put, we don't record the video, first and foremost, some patients don't know that. We don't store the video, except in research protocols. And all of this would apply if you're sending photos or videos by other means. The HIPAA regulations are very specific about this and we have to keep things private. And that brings up yet another issue, which is if you're conferring uh, and using some of these services on portable devices, are they HIPAA compliant? And not just on the provider end, is my system HIPAA compliant, but is the patient's end? So an example of this would be if a patient sends me an email from a Gmail, that's his or her choice sending it to me. But what I send back to his or her Gmail, I have to make sure not to do anything that reveals their identity or the specifics of their illness because someone could tap that. It's not HIPAA compliant Gmail, for example. In regular Skype, it's the same way. So those are a little bit of asides, but I, this last slide is, you know, we're in a patient-centered era. You know, we're moving patients to health or better mental health. We're trying to move populations. Team is the name of the game. And then helping a system of care. And technology just simply makes these things come together and easier. So the last uh, piece here is just a little bit about competencies for training clinicians and residents or students 
we put together the article, one of the references, and uh, we tiered levels of tele mental health competency based on novice or advanced beginner, competent or proficient, and then expert levels. And the, the article, you can read more about that if you want. But teaching competencies in clinicians about clinical skills, is, it's no longer the era or the model of just sort of wing it or just do it. We have to use t adult learning theory or child learning theory in these contexts, and then we have to evaluate how people learn at the beginning, cross-sectionally, and then longitudinally. And then we need to include this thing called feedback. Now, most people think of feedback is when their partner gives them feedback that they don't like. That's, that's called negative feedback and life experience. But feedback, whether it's good or bad, is part of learning. And we need to do that with all of these people. And sometimes that's patients, too. And institutional leaders need to think that, hey, we, technology is a tool and it's going to help us. But, gee, I might have to spend a little time helping my faculty or my clinicians get used to it and, and do it well. So the competencies related to patient care or practice-based learning, this is in a gigantic table in that article um, that uh, we did on the competencies. But some examples here, patient care, you take histories about the same way over video, but it's a little different. You have to use, for example, more visual gestures than just your voice. Uh, you have to sometimes notice something about someone rather than giving them a handshake. And if they start to tear up, you have to say, I, I see that you're crying. There may be a tissue box there. Would you like a tissue? Instead of just handing them a tissue. Very basic clinical skills to engage them. Now, the young kids love it. And they love the option of basically turning off the unit if they don't like what you're saying. Hopefully it doesn't happen too often. So we, but you have to think about technology just a little bit different. And then when we use teaching methodology, instead of just lecturing people sort of, I know it and they should learn it, we're using models that there's much more engagement from teacher and learner. So you can do that with cases, you can do with interviews, and you can um, do standardized patients, and these things will help prep you for tele mental health care. So the research I'm doing now shows that there's a there's a window probably between five and ten encounters, patient visits, where you you get the feel of tele mental health, and it becomes much more natural, and you slightly adjust your clinical skills. And more or less, most people do fine with about five to 10 encounters. And then they have this touch up the things uh, as they need to learn. So uh, those are the, these are tables of resources that say more and they're in the article on competencies if you want to see those. And so, you know, the overarching message I have here is what is your objective? What outcome do you want to achieve? And what do you plug in the middle, including video conferencing and teaching methods to accomplish that? You pick a model and you maintain the standard of care, good care, and use technology as a friend rather than being anxious about it. Just try to embrace it. And then when new things come along, like asynchronous uh, methods where you can do a patient interview and forward it to a specialist to review and give you an opinion, just like we've done with um, head CTs that were taken on one site, sent to a radiologist for an opinion, the results were sent back. So when asynchronous methods are there or new apps and, the, and other newer, better processes come up, then hopefully you can use them with a little enthusiasm and a little bit of caution. So I'll pause for that. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Hilty. We do have a couple of questions. One is very logistical that I can quickly answer. We will be sharing a recording of this webinar as well as the slides and any supplemental information that our presenters are mentioning, like the tables that Dr. Hilty just mentioned, uh, with all participants after the webinar. 
So with that, I, we do have a couple of questions um, that I'll go ahead and, and facilitate here. When is it appropriate to use asynchronous versus synchronous telepsychiatry in the clinical setting? What, um, so the question is about asynchronous telepsychiatry? Yes, what, when is it appropriate to use that versus synchronous? Well, just uh, this, uh, Dr. Hilty replying, just so that if you're listening on audio, you know who's speaking. I'm going to look first at how we define asynchronous. So asynchronous could be um, email because it's asynchronous, one point in time sent and then received on the other end. Asynchronous could be a video taken at one point in time and sent somewhere else for evaluation. So the I think the major issue with asynchronous is that there's not a billing mechanism. So if you're a clinician or an administrator, you have to keep that in mind. However, that's just a short-sighted view. The nice thing about asynchronous is it's the, the, it builds relationships between providers and it, it allows you to be much more efficient so that you need less direct clinical time. So I, the first thing I would say is that it's efficient. Uh, the second thing I would say is that many family physicians who want curbside consults do not like to get on the phone and wait for someone they're trying to get through to someone. Not everyone feels comfortable giving out their cell phone, so they hop on their computer, they type a quick note to someone they know, and they send it off. And by the next time they see the patient, they have a usually have an answer. Um, if it's more urgent, they call them and they make it synchronous uh, just by telephone. The but I think there are a lot of populations that are hard to reach, and uh, the study. Uh, that we did in Central California, Dr. Yaldis took the lead on that, was basically filming um, medical assistants and staff who were trained to do semi-structured short interviews, for example, 20 item questionnaires for screening mental health issues. It was videotaped, a little bit of health information was sent with that, and then it was shipped off to a psychiatry provider it would have been, it's very, very efficient and easy to do that. And in the, instead of seeing one person in a clinical hour, you can, we estimate you can see four. You can see four videos and then skip through them and review the key data much more efficiently. So the, now the, the only thing you need is, is a webcam and you need a, a way to compress the video, which is most people are familiar with these days, and then you have to make sure it's HIPAA compliant, sent securely, so it can't be interrupted. So the question, um, I would rephrase the question, I do that a lot when I'm teaching, uh, the, the question may be, at this point, even though folks are not ready for it, is when would you not use it? It's so darn efficient and the younger generations, and even some of my generation, are so familiar with technology, texting and sending pictures and whatnot, that why wouldn't you use it? You should build in asynchronous from the beginning. So that's one of the small, small studies I did was for, for new mental health referrals from a rural primary care network, the wait was about two months for them to get a video conference with me. So we did phone and email consultations. Clinical treatments were started, and at least a third of the patients no longer needed the video conference. They were already off and running. Some of them were better. And the ones who weren't better than I saw by video. So it's, this is not just about billing and making money. If you, you see the value of this for a, for a rural health system or a capitated health system, you can get more good clinical care done by using low intervention technologies that are more efficient and putting them as part of an overall relationship you have with a video conferencing person. Terry, I don't know if you'd like to say more. No, I think you covered that well done. Thank you. 
Great. And we have several more questions. Some of them I am going to be able to answer via text. So I will go ahead and do that. And in the interest of time and wanting to make sure that Dr. Rabinowitz um, has time to present his information, I think we will move forward and we'll have another opportunity at the end of the webinar uh, for additional questions. Thanks, Danielle. And I will um, speed through some slides that I think are less uh, important or relevant, and you can always see uh, more of that text if you wish uh, from the, uh, your, your own download of the talks. Um, just let's talk a little bit. I, uh, I'm, I'm speaking because uh, I wanted to give you an idea about what happens, uh, what we do by uh, taking what Dr. Hilty talked about um, and, and translating it into a real world situation. Let's talk about late life depression. Um, it leads to significant mor uh, morbidity, family burden, more health, uh, more use of healthcare resources. It's under-recognized and under-treated, regardless of where you are, primary care, nursing homes, etc. often taken as just a normal part of aging. Uh, prevalence rates in men and women become about equal after the age of 55 to 65, and the frequency with which people with depression seek treatment declines shortly, shortly or sharply after the age of 55. So that's a problem. People get more depressed, but they don't talk about it. They don't get help. Um, they attribute the symptoms to something else. They're embarrassed about having psychological or psychiatric problems. There's a feeling that it's just automatic, that you, it happens in old age. And oftentimes, elders who are grieving because they lose Many of their friends uh, can't distinguish between grief and depression. It's common in the ambulatory medical care setting, 30 to 50% of patients may have depressive symptoms. In the long-term care setting, that is in, among nursing home residents, one out of four patients may meet full-blown criteria for major depression. And caregivers, and other loved ones can get stressed out by these problems as well. Uh, of more than one and a half million residents of US nursing homes, 80% have psychiatric disorders, including depression, dementia, and other problems. Associated problems can be just as bad. Worth health, worth health, worse health outcomes, increased hospital use, and high mortality, not only from illnesses, but from suicide. And suicide does occur in nursing home residents as well. This is worse in rural areas. And I happen to live in the only big city in Burlington, uh, in Vermont, Burlington, Vermont. The rest of our state is virtually all rural, uh, as is upstate New York, where we also perform consultations. So we had challenges and we got requests. Rural nursing homes in Vermont and New York couldn't comply with federally mandated uh, 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 mandates, uh, which require that residents have access to competent psychiatric care. So they needed telepsychiatry and we were happy to oblige. Uh, I visited sites in New York and Vermont. I chose nursing homes. Uh, to deliver care because I work with that population. I've done research in the population and I like the population. I had to get licensed, I had to get credential, it took some time. Uh, at the consultation, we have a nurse familiar with the resident uh, and with MDS, that's the minimum data set, that's the uh, mandated um, assessment instrument, not only assesses psychiatric conditions, but virtually uh, across the gamut for elders. Uh, behaviors, health, uh, mentation, uh, nutrition, continence, etc. During the visit, the nurse helps to facilitate the consultation with the elder, and in follow-up, I discuss the care with uh, the the uh, referring physician as well as with the nurse. Social worker is present virtually 100% of the time, and family members are encouraged to attend. Just to tell you about what we learned from our telepsychiatry work, these are findings for 106 patients that represented uh, 278 encounters. Two thirds were female, the average age was about 77 and a half years. Depression, dementia, and delirium 
comprised about 21% each of the diagnoses. Adjustment disorders were present in about 12%. Behavioral disturbances were present in 17%. And these disturbances were exacerbated by vision and hearing problems. And as you can imagine, or as you may know from uh, having a loved one or more in a nursing home, hearing aids and eyeglasses are the first th two things to be lost whenever an elder is admitted. Uh, and they're, uh, they're lost sometimes permanently and no one bothers to replace them. And they can affect an elder's behaviors because they're not taking in as much data. They have to deal with that in some way. And if they have cognitive problems, the way that they deal with less data may be to have worse behaviors. Just to give you an idea about what we did, here's the average distance and time that one would have to travel to the nursing home in Vermont or New York that we studied. Uh, it's a pretty long trip, 208 minutes, uh, 208 miles, I'm sorry, 240 minute round trip for the nursing home in New York. The mean number of encounters per patient was about 2.6. We had 278 total encounters that we analyzed. And important here, the charges that we put out were about $65,000, $66,000. Mean charge was about $237, the range as you can see. And here's the time that would have been spent if one were to go ahead and do a face-to-face -face encounter. One would have to travel for more than one month. This is straight travel, not an eight-hour day, but straight through the day. More than one month of total travel time. Distance, 43,000 miles. Fuel costs back when we did the estimation was almost $4,000. And we estimated if one were to charge out at a rate of $100, $200, $300 uh, per hour, the personnel costs for a patient to come to a physician would be as high as $67,000 for a physician to visit a patient more than a quarter of a million dollars. When we subtract what our telemedicine charges were, which were quite modest in comparison, we came up with a net estimate of cost savings as high as $232,000 for <coughs> these 278 encounters. And we had nice outcomes. You can diagnose and treat patients with delirium, depression, or disruptive behaviors, and they get better. Residents, many of whom are demented, accepted the modality and understand it. Two quotes. It's pretty cool, and it saves you a trip, doctor, both from patients with cognitive impairment. They got it. Family and staff really like it, and it saves time and money. We published our findings in the Journal of Telemedicine and eHealth in 2010, and the study continues because I continue to do nursing home resident consultations on a regular basis. Um, something else to consider that Don touched on a little bit, but challenges. Telemedicine has the potential to connect patients and providers worldwide. It sounds good and it is good, but we need to be aware of and sensitive about cultural, ethnic, and other differences between a patient and a provider that may influence or affect the telemedicine encounter. Um, some of the differences, and I know I'm speaking to the choir, you're probably all familiar with this, but I show you the slide because we have to be aware of these things that make us different. So if I'm consulting down the street to someone <clears throat> from the same state, same socioeconomic background, et cetera, that consultation is going to be very different than if I were to consult to a single Muslim 27-year-old woman who lives in Afghanistan. And we have to be aware of that, especially when we're using telemedicine uh, so that we can make the encounter as beneficial and as data-rich as possible. Good news. Although there are a few large studies of telemedicine or cross cultures or that examine potential problems between providers and patients with important differences, we basically see that it works 
And I think that's very positive for the future of telemedicine. So to increase the likelihood, likelihood that your telepsychiatry encounter will be successful, know your patients. Where are they from? What's their background? What do you know about that group, that culture, or study it before you do your work? Know your technology, be comfortable with the apparatus. As Don said, five to 10 encounters will help to make you a local expert, but feel comfortable with that machinery, because if you're comfortable, patients will be comfortable. If you're fumping around, patients are not gonna believe that you know what you're doing. You're not gonna look very good uh, behind the camera or in front of the camera. And finally, get help from your local telehealth resource center. Um, we're here throughout the country to help folks who are interested in starting up programs or, or who are interested in growing their programs. So with that, I will say thank you, and we have a little time for questions. Excellent. Thank you so much to both of you. We do have a few questions. Um, I, I answered several of them via text and hopefully did them justice, uh, but they were more logistical in nature or, again, uh, reiterated that folks can feel free to reach out to their regional telehealth resource centers uh, to help um, address questions around uh, planning, implementation, etc. Uh, so this is a question that um, I wanted to ask of our presenters. In your experience, what activities have helped with provider adoption of telepsychiatry? What do they prefer? What don't they like? Uh, I can tell you one thing that I think has worked better than anything else. Um, we have, over the years, recorded our, our encounters. We've done that with patient, family, uh, and provider permissions. And I show little clips of these encounters when I give talks to laypersons and to professionals. And I find that <clears throat> those encounters steal the show. In fact, I don't have to do anything. Just play these encounters and people really love what they see and appreciate that the encounter that's done over a long distance is as rich, as powerful as one done face to face. The, uh, I can add to that uh, as well. I think uh, having a relationship uh, in the context and so you can introduce the technology is very important. So we're gonna have telepsychiatry to our hospital emergency room and I'll probably do the first few consultations from our own center with the emergency room docs and the, and the social work staff so that, because they know me and that the way they're, they can just see that this is real and it's possible. And I think the, the other thing is uh, in the beginning when, when the patients turn to their family physicians and said, this care was great and they know what they're doing and technology works. The family physicians and pediatricians said, hey, this is great. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So uh, hopefully a quick question. Um, Dr. Hilty, did you say that most clinicians would be deemed competent with TP after five to 10 hours of training? I think if, the, if their attitude is good and the training is designed, then they should adapt the skills and the knowledge to be very good clinically. Currently, ironically, we have no international or national standard for training, uh, nor is any required. It's just that from my experience working with uh, teams of psychiatrists and other specialists and working with residents and students, we usually, this is the training model we're using, which is five to 10 hours of work with supervision and feedback. And the nice thing about this uh, in this day and age too is that um, individual providers could actually do some consultations and as long as they didn't make any drastic or faux pas during the, the session, they could video capture their performance and send it to someone to get feedback at a distance. Um, and they could, you know, edit out the patient part uh, or de-identify it. So people can train from a distance. We're just looking for basic, good quality care. But you know, as clinicians and teachers, 
But hospital administrators, national organizations, and people who do licensing at some point are probably going to want some standard training. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, just so that, because I know we're, we're very close to the end of our time here, could we get uh, just advanced to the, the next slide so that folks can see information about our February webinar? I want to make sure that that um, is visible to everyone. Our uh, colleagues with the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center are going to be uh, hosting. It will be telehealth and workplace health, which is definitely um, an, a focus area that we're getting increasing amounts of um, requests and interest in across the United States. Uh, Rob Sprang will be the presenter. He's the director of Kentucky, Kentucky Telecare. That will be on Thursday, February 18th, and all of the various time zones are uh, available below. And I also want to thank our colleague uh, Becky Sanders and the team at um, the UMTRC, Upper Midwest TRC, for continually hosting uh, these webinars uh, throughout the year and, and um, having the Zoom for us. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and jump back to the questions, but I wanted to make sure that everybody uh, who is still with us had the opportunity to, to hear about next month's webinar, and I hope that you can join us again. Um, next question, are you aware of any peer or quality review issues arising highlighting particular risks in using TP? I, I think it's a great question. I'm not aware of specific risks, that is, published risks or published um, bad outcomes using telepsychiatry, uh, but I think that one has to be worried about them and you have to be somewhat um, preventive in your approach. That is, if you're going to use a te technology like telepsychiatry, you need to make sure that the distant site is somewhat secure. By that I mean if you're seeing a patient and that patient is in a room by him or herself, you'd want to have some kind of safety uh, mechanism built in uh, just outside of that room so that you could have, uh, you could call someone to intervene if you felt that you had someone who was acutely at risk. Uh, I'd defer to Don if he has any further information about that. Yeah, I think there are some uh, tips that I would offer. Uh, it depends on the model you're using, but if you're doing direct care and you're a therapist doing telemental health or a psychiatrist doing telepsychiatry, it's an incumbent on you to know where your patient is. And, it's a, and you, you should know or have some idea, maybe even a brief chat with them if an emergency were to occur, what's the plan? That way, is there a loved one nearby? What are the local resources? Um, and if you know what community are they're in and they became for some reason depressed or suicidal and they hadn't told anyone before the video, it's not that the video caused it, it's just they hadn't told anyone, then you'd at least know local resources to call. Um, I think this, the, another important thing is, um, you know, some of the young generations would just like to do FaceTime or Skype and that would be very suitable to them. But, but we as providers and health systems have to make sure both ends, the patient end and our end, are HIPAA compliant. So we don't want people to inadvertently access uh, important mental health visit um, um, because they were hacking. Now, to be honest, um, no one has hacked my mental health consultations. I think, one, um, they'd rather hack uh, credit cards, and two, if they hack my consultations, they might fall asleep. So, um, you know, uh, but I think we have to be safe. Thanks. Great. Thank you. We still have 66 participants, so as long as our presenters are, are okay with hanging on for a couple more minutes. Uh, we will, I'll continue with the questions. And please know that any questions that we are not able to answer today just due to time, um, these are phenomenal questions. I'm so glad that there's so much engagement here that we'll be sure to answer them in, in the follow-up email. So what do, what do we think presenters? One or two more questions? Sure. Would that be okay? Okay. What technology solution have you used for synchronous telepsychiatry visits? Which companies are leaders in this arena? You know, uh, we don't use a particular technology solution if, if you're referring to like a, a group uh, of providers. We're individual providers here. As far as particular technology, uh, because we are a telehealth resource center, 
we really are not uh, in the business of uh, recommending one over another. My advice is that if you um, wonder about the different technologies, be in touch with your local telehealth resource center, or actually any telehealth resource center, and uh, you can discuss this at greater length with, um, uh, with, with the folks there, especially those who have particular expertise in the technology. But I, I couldn't and wouldn't uh, recommend a particular platform. <coughs> I would say one thing, they're all pretty darn good. Uh, you know, there's such competition now to make a better mousetrap that um, you can't really go wrong if you use any of the, uh, the major platforms. Um, I, I can't add too much to that. I mean, people have been using polycom systems for a long time. There's low cost polycom systems that are HIPAA compliant, but there are others now too. Um, some people are trying to use Skype business, which has uh, more protections than regular Skype, but that's only on one end. You'd have to ensure both ends have the same HIPAA compliance. That people are using WebEx, um, there's, a, there's just a ton of low-cost um, uh, resources you can use right out of your office. And um, if you're going to um, consider, you know, doing telepsychiatry, doing telemental health, there's a book uh, in, uh, written by Kathleen Myers and Carolyn Turvey that has a chapter in it about setting up telepsychiatry. It doesn't necessarily go over name brands and all that kind of thing, but it, the key question it asks is, are you gonna try and do this on your own? And are you, do you have some dexterity with technology such that you as a consumer can just go out there and check out the options yourself? You're, you'd have to be a little bit of a technophile to do that. Or do you wanna hire a telehealth company to come in, put your platform in, do the technology so you don't have to, and then pay them a regular fee. That's usually the first question. In, a, in an academic center, you usually have something like, uh, you have a team that sets up the units, so we don't have to do those. But in real practice across the professions, that, that's the first question. So that book by Myers and Turvey may be, uh, may be a good one to, to check out. I think we can take one more question live. You're muted, Danielle. Thank you, Dr. Rabinowitz. So, so excited that we have still several remaining questions, but we'll end with this one. We will answer all of the additional questions via email. Um, so I guess, wow, how do I choose? Have you had any experience using telepsychiatry in non-traditional locations such as schools, jails, et cetera? I personally have not. But I have colleagues around the country who use uh, telepsychiatry in, in several non-traditional settings, including uh, to incarcerated uh, folks using it, um, uh, using it um, in, in uh, virtual uh, uh, meeting rooms for kids with cystic fibrosis who can't be in uh, the same uh, location together for fear of cross-contamination. Um, uh, using it um, for elders who travel during the uh, the seasons, uh, my my colleague Cornelia Cremens calls them snowboard uh, snowbirds, who uh, migrate uh, south from uh, her location in Massachusetts to Florida, who need to keep in touch with their uh, psychiatrist during the year. So these are some of the non traditional settings that I'm familiar with. The uh, child psychiatrists are doing a lot in the schools, and um, but that's and they're also doing juvenile halls. There are a number of papers written by Kathleen Myers and others. Um, and as I recall, when I was in Baltimore for the American Telemedicine Association meeting, I saw some people present from the University of Maryland who were working with the, that particular county. I don't remember the name of the county for Baltimore, Maryland, but. They had a, a funded project where they were doing school-based consultations. And, um, you know, my interest, I, I like working with children and adolescents, so I'm an adult psychiatrist. And gosh, you know, wouldn't it be great if, if there was a way safely and with all everything uh, 
administered correctly to have videos of kids in class so you could actually see the ADHD or see that it's not ADHD um, and be able to, to use that in clinical care. So there's potential there, just have to work out some of the factors. Fantastic. Thanks. And we there is some great research around that Baltimore um, model, and we'd be happy as part of the, the email that we send out, we can we can share some of that information. Thank you so very much, Dr. Hilty and Dr. Rabinowitz. This was fantastic. Uh, we had a lot of engaged folks, and we so appreciate your time and sharing of your expertise. Thank you to all the participants, especially those who have hung around um, for a few extra minutes. We really enjoyed this time with you today. Please, your opinion so does matter to us. Uh, you'll see on this, the last, the very last slide, there's a link to our Survey Monkey. Um, just re you know, requesting your input on what you thought of today's webinar and how we might continue to meet your needs uh, in regard to programming for telehealth. Um, thank you so much. I hope you all have a fantastic day, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks.